Here we are. We are live. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, it is my esteemed pleasure to kick off this first guest session of the free JavaScript and free web development boot camps. If you're tuning in for the first time and wondering what's going on here, um, I will point you to where you uh, signed up. I just realized, oh my goodness. <laughs> I had it playing in another tab and I started hearing my voice. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, if you're wondering, you can sign up at classcentral.com for these boot camps. They're completely free um, and they are supposed to be self-paced. So don't worry if you need to catch up. Don't stress about doing both. We are here to learn and we're here to learn so in a fun, effective way. So today's guest session is learning how to learn for programmers. And with me today, I've got two wonderful guests. Dr. Barbara Oakley and Zach Caceres. Caceres? Caceres. You, you did it perfectly, Ramon. I'm impressed. Ah, oh, it's my <laughs> Spanish speaking. I'm glad it worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, fabulous. Let's, let's, I'm going to have the honor of introducing you both, and then I'm just going to pop into the corner. I'm going to be watching for questions, and I will gather these up, and we will have a delightful Q&A session after you're done. So, Barb here is a distinguished professor of engineering at Oakland University. And last time we chatted, you were running the biggest MOOC in the world, which is the Learning How to Learn course on Coursera. But now I'm told you're running a whole bunch of other courses as well. Well, the years go by and we keep adding great new things. So it's fun, but it's always fun being back working with you, Class Central, and working with Zach. I love it. Zach here is the tech lead at Clarify Financial, coming to us live from Denver in Colorado, and you're also doing consulting of production-grade software systems. Thanks so much, Ramon. It is wonderful to have you both here. I'm going to bring up your slides, and folks, just bear in mind, Please ask questions, but we are going to answer these toward the end. So we'll have a Q&A session after the, the presentation, and I will have saved all of your comments. I promise. I hope to get all of them, and we will save them and answer them there. So without further ado, I will let you both take it away. Thank you both once again. Well, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here with you all. Um, uh, but both Barb and I will uh, introduce, say a little bit about how it is that we ended up in this world of engineering before we get into the, the meat of the material. So in, in my case, there was really no indication that I would become a programmer. There was not much, you know, my childhood that indicated lots of technical ability. I like books. I like playing classical guitar. I liked being outside. I did not start programming at a young age I'm from a small town in rural Maryland where, you know, I never met anyone who was, you know, a software engineer. Um, and I don't really think I, I spent any time with a single person who built with code until I was in my 20s. I didn't study computer science at university, and the world of code was a mystery to me. And to some extent, it felt unattainable. Right. Building with code to me, it was like it was something for the elite. It was like the exclusive realm of people who studied CS at Stanford, whereas I was someone who had left school uh, in ninth grade. Right. Which is about as far from Stanford as, as you can get. Uh, and I had this perception that coding was off limits to me as well as a career. Right. And I stayed focused on, you know, business skills, people skills, soft skills, not technology. That's what I thought I was good at. And I really thought it would be impossible for me to change my brain and to become technical. And so here's just a little bit about my own background. So uh, as we're syncing up our slides here. So uh, for me, I, I grew up moving all over the United States. And one thing that happened was that I, I hated mathematics. And so I basically flunked my way through elementary, middle and high school math and science. I, I loved animals, as you can see here. And I liked knitting and weaving and all that kind of stuff. I knew I could never grow up and do anything technical. So I decided I wanted to learn another language, um, which I know for many of you is like no brainer. You already speak two or three languages 
or more. But for me, it seemed to be something really fascinating. And I wanted to try to learn another language, but I couldn't afford to go to college. So, but I, I did find out there was one way to learn another language and actually get paid for it. And that was to join the military. So here you see me uh, looking very nervous about to throw a hand grenade. And if you knew how clumsy I was, you would know why I look so nervous. But I did learn another language. I learned Russian. And I ended up working on Soviet trawlers up in the Bering Sea in the last days of the Cold War. And I just loved having new adventures and seeing new perspectives. So I also ended up at the South Pole Station in Antarctica, which is where I met my husband. So I'd like to say that I had to go to the end of the earth to meet that man. But the challenge for me was uh, I was reaching 26 years old. I was about to get out of the military and no one would hire me. I had done everything people had told me to do. I'd followed my passion. I'd learned a language really well. And guess what? The market was not looking for someone at that time whose sole professional expertise was Slavic languages and literature. In fact, by doing what everyone said, which was follow your passion, I was actually, as I came to discover, being a bit selfish because I was doing what I wanted, but not really taking into account what the world needed. So at age 26, I just thought, well, you know, if I can't get a job, why don't I see if I can change my brain, use that adventurous spirit to see if I can change myself. And so I went to the university and started with the lowest level possible uh, of mathematics, which was remedial high school mathematics, totally low level learning algebra sort of math. And I slowly began climbing my way upward. It was not easy, but if I'd known then, what I know now about how to learn more easily, I could have made it much, much simpler on myself. And these are the kinds of ideas that Zach and I would like to share with you today. Ideas coming from people who have really learned the hard way as Zach and I have about how to be successful in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math kinds of disciplines, which include coding. And there is incredible in insight from neuroscience and from cognitive psychology and from our own experiences that we will share to help you learn more quickly and effectively. One of the, the first things to understand about why it is that we might want to explore these neuroscientific ideas and ideas from cognitive psychology um, is that programming is an extremely weird and unnatural behavior. And we kind of forget it now because it's an established profession. But thinking about abstract symbols all day for 99.999% of human history was a really great way to get selected right out of the gene pool. Right. It's not natural to sit in a chair for eight hours and try to figure out where you forgot to put the semicolon. Right. Programming also demands a kind of intense focus, almost a, almost a neurotic focus, the kind of focus that was typically applied only in small adrenaline fueled bursts in the past when primitive humans were hunting or running from a predator or fighting or negotiating with rivals, a very different context to a, a calm modern day job. Um, programming is weird even by modern engineering standards. Uh, 19th and 20th century engineering was much more physical. It was much more hands-on. And the kinds of constraints that you were dealing with were hard and physical. They were the, the, you know, the laws of physics. What makes software systems unique is that software is it's highly malleable. You can change it in so many ways and the constraints are softer. So oftentimes the limits are not the laws of physics. The limits are imagination. Can you maintain it? And, and human factors. Those are often the relevant constraints. In fact, some people argue that software systems are inherently more complex than physical systems because they're designed. You, you can't visualize the whole design in detail and understand all of its implications. 
So this makes software powerful and wonderful, but also really bug prone, really confusing, really stressful. You have this unlimited freedom and that freedom can be overwhelming. So to thrive in such a unique and young discipline, many default behaviors, behaviors that we grew up doing, behaviors that might have worked in other areas of our life, we shouldn't assume that they're naturally well adapted to this weird, very modern world of software. And there are a few, you know, unique and maybe even eccentric behaviors or habits that can help us be more effective. You know, learning how to learn and the kinds of ideas that Barb is going to share today is more relevant for software engineers than many other fields. Now, the other reason why these ideas are relevant to the software engineer uh, is that programming is hard. So the, uh, the chart there that you see in this slide is an image from a popular blog post that's how to learn front-end web development. So I think in theory, this chart is supposed to make people feel comfortable and excited about navigating their learning path. But at least for me, when I see a chart like this, that just gives me anxiety because it's like, wow, there's the next 5,000 hours of learning that I'm going to need to invest to get through this, this crazy chart, right? And uh, this is to some extent reflective of the life of the engineer because Programming demands you, that you are constantly learning. You're learning a new system. You're learning uh, things that are that apply only to a particular new job. You know there are all these tools and the web development toolkit and tech is constantly churning and changing. And there's a new hot thing. You know, and you're you're paid every day to learn and to navigate. And since you're constantly paid to learn, learning how to learn is going to make you more effective and it's going to make you navigate this field more quickly and be more successful. That's exactly right. So how do we learn? The key idea here, there, there's one central simple concept, and that is that you have a bunch of neurons and in, you can look at the neurons, they've got these arms that reach out, sort of these legs called dendrites. And interestingly, they have these things called dendritic spines, like toes that stick out of the legs. That's really all you need to know about neurons because neurons, there's a bunch of them, 86 billion in the brain, but what they're really doing when you are learning something is they are making connections between one another in long-term memory. This is whatever you are learning. You are making links between neurons in long-term memory, whether you're learning how to code, how to take a derivative, how to conjugate a verb, how to do a dance step, how to play a musical instrument, whatever you're learning, you're creating sets of links in long-term memory. Now, sadly, over the last 30, 40 years, um, psychologists, cognitive psychologists in particular, have often made the point that you don't need to remember anything because you can always look it up. Well, that's come to a roaring stop recently as neuroscientific evidence has revealed that if you don't have those links in long-term memory, you actually don't know it. How can you build higher level concepts if you don't have the basics in your mind? I could never speak another language if I didn't have those links in mind. It doesn't help if I can look it up on Google Translate. So, so getting those links in long-term memory is a critical, critical part of learning. And what we want to do here today is help you see tricks to get those links built more rapidly and effectively in your brain. Because once you can get, in, get them in there, you can practice with them, you can strengthen them. And what will happen is when you've got that nice, strong set of neural links, you can easily pull them to mind when you want to work with them. So when I say the neocortex, a lot of times people are kind of like, yeah, well, it's kind of brain stuff, right? But let me show you exactly what part of the brain it actually is. So we have these sets of links and they're, they're kind of embedded in this thin layer at the, the edges of your brain. Some of it folds down and so forth. But that layer is about two millimeters thick. 
So we've got these neural links, they're embedded very, you know, they're tiny in this kind of, it's like a napkin sized piece uh, of, or it's like a, a dinner napkin when you unfold it. And I'll unfold it for you here so you can see what it looks like. This is half a brain. You spread it out, add the other half, and it's about, oh, a meter, just a little less than a meter by a meter, two and a half feet by two and a half feet. So you've got this nice thin layer and that is where you're depositing most of those links of learning that you're laying as you're acquiring a new expertise. So let's talk about the, the, the brain from the standpoint of the software engineer. Um, there's mountains written about making uh, software development easier, right? There, there's tools and philosophies of software development and project management techniques and books and courses. And there's a thousand and one things like this. You know, you've probably felt the swirl of all this jargon around, you know, that this programmer, like in the slide, right? Um, much of this education is about technology itself. You know, what is clean code? What's a unit test? What's scalable architecture? A lot of companies and curricula are really good at teaching that. And what's too often missing is that at the center of, the, of it all is a human with a brain, right? No one really teaches you explicit workflows for the execution of programming tasks with the fact that the brain has serious limitations. You know, has anyone ever talked to you, for instance, candidly about focus, time management, how long to spend on a bug before taking a break, procrastination, learning new technology systematically, anxiety management, the effect of smartphones and social media on programmer productivity. Now, um, you'll often hear a lot of people talk about soft skills, right? And soft skills are writing and speaking about technical topics and being effective in that way. And that's great. And that's a, a whole other, that's a talk for another day. What we're talking about here is specifically how to use your brain, you know, as, as this cognitive tool, since it is the thing that is at the center of your tool chain. It's just as much at the center of your tool chain as the language or the, the editor for editing code that you like to use. And these cognitive skills matter because the brain has such serious limitations, which Barb will now talk about. So let's, let's first uh, describe the two, well, the fundamental uh, memory source in your brain, what that long-term memory it is. It's, it's where you're depositing these sets of links. And long-term memory is kind of in the neocortex scattered around your brain. We tend to think of an area around the front of the brain as holding what we call working memory. Uh, for your purposes, you can think of it as more or less short-term memory, what you can remember in a very limited way. So for example, if you um, might go to a hotel room and they'll give you your room number and you'll remember it long enough to get into your hotel room uh, or someone gives you a code and you're transcribing it, you'll remember it long enough to transcribe that code short-term memory. So that's pretty much what working memory is. It has short-term plus it's manipulating a little bit. But I like to think of working memory as an octopus because octopus have like arms and arms can hold things. In our case, it's almost like not an octopus, but a quadrupus. It's got four arms on it because people can on average hold about four things in their working memory. So what you're doing is with that working memory, you can reach into long-term memory and grab those sets of links and pull them to mind. So oftentimes when you're first learning something, you're creating these sets of links in long-term memory. And yeah, that working memory is assisting with this process so that later your working memory can go and grab those sets of links and begin to work with them. Now, you may think, yeah, but can you give me a practical example of this? And it so happens I can. 
it involves our younger daughter, my husband's and my daughter, Rachel. I asked her um, if she could model for me what it looked like when she was first learning to back up a car. And since at that time she had very recently learned to back up a car, she was like, mom, I can do this. So watch her little face as she is modeling what it felt like for her when she was first learning to back up a car. Notice how she'll watch the mirror, then she'll turn over, and then she's like looking to the front, looking to the back. She's kind of confused. And then off she goes into a ditch. And what was happening was her working memory, remember, it can hold up to four things. Well, she had more than four things that she was trying to process at once. It's what's called a heavy cognitive load, and there was no working memory available for anything else. So, but once she learned to back up that car, it became a simple matter. All she ever had to do to back up the car was just call to mind, oh, I want to back up a car. She could pull those links to mind. And she had a light cognitive load with other arms available, right? So she could think about, is my seatbelt fastened? Or is, uh, what, what's the song on the radio? She has working memory, in other words, available for more complex thinking, as well as that more simple uh, process of, that she was accomplishing in, in backing up the car. But when you are, let's say you're sitting down to uh, take a test or you are on a programming job, what you're really going to be expected to do is to pretty much metaphorically bounce right up there with that working memory and haul these accomplished sets of links that you have practiced and put into long-term memory and connect them together in novel ways. So if you practiced with the materials and created those links of expertise, it's a simple matter to connect them together with working memory. However, if you have not practiced and developed those sets of links, what happens is this, you sit down, you begin to try to work on that, that programming problem and there's no links there. So you can actually just not solve the problem. And then you're, you're wondering why that happened because you thought you really knew the material. This is called an illusion of competence. Now, one thing that will come up later is that working memory capacities vary. On average, people have about four arms on their working memory. You might think, oh, I would like to have much more because I'll learn so much more quickly. And it's true. People with bigger working memory capacity can learn more quickly. However, I am a person who is a proud owner of a more limited capacity working memory. And there are real advantages to that, as we'll discuss. Others, as I mentioned, can learn more swiftly because they have a larger capacity working memory. So different, it's important to be aware of the different working memory capacities, what your working memory capacity is, if you can get a sense of that, and, uh, and to, um, to just know that whether it's large, small, or intermediate, you can be just as successful by using different learning techniques. Some people are what I call race car learners. Others are more like hiker learners. But whatever it is, you can get to that finish line. Hiker learners benefit by breaking information up into chunks so they can climb more easily through these small bit by bit chunks and of course, as I found as well, extra practice can be really beneficial. So let's look at some example of specific habits uh, that would impact the working memory of the software engineer. 
Now, as, as Barb pointed out, people with larger working memories do likely have at least an initial advantage uh, as an engineer because they can hold more context and more variables in their head uh, at once. So, so in this way, there is a, a light talent dimension here, but there is so much within the programmer's control that they can use to optimize the working memory that you have, whether that's the three-legged octopus or the seven-legged octopus, right? Um, now, uh, even people with big working memories that have a lot of advantages, often they have habits and behaviors that work against them that really kind of nullify that, uh, that natural advantage that they may have. So let's look at a couple examples, right? The first is a million tabs. Now, I don't know if, about you, but my browser looks like this. Uh, next slide, please, Barb. Uh, that's when I'm trying to find that one tab with the docs I need, right? You're flipping through a thousand pages, looking around, you know, trying to find this relevant information. Or how about uh, when I'm trying to find that one error message in the console? You know, this is like finding a needle, needle in a haystack. Right, or, or maybe when I'm trying to find that one file that I was working on in, in my editor and I'm weaving through 18 different windows of five different projects trying to go through, right? Um, oftentimes when I pair with an early stage programmer, when I, when I pair program with them, you'll see a thousand windows and files open. There's notifications popping up everywhere. WhatsApp is chiming. Their cell phone's on their desk ringing every five seconds because Twitter's sending them push notifications. And um, you know, they're, they're logging a hundred different things in the console, trying to find the one error message. And then when I ask them, hey, wh what problem, what's the problem? What are you working on right now? They'll kind of meander through the files. They'll say some stuff, get lost along the way. And they'll say, well, I was going to fix this bug on the login screen, but then I realized the user module needed to refactor. And then there was a bug in one of the unit tests. And then, and then, and then, and, you know, you, they, they almost can't even say what the problem is because there's been so much saturation of things in their working memory, they've, they've lost the plot, right? And it also leads to really dumb mistakes that I'm sure all of us have experienced as, uh, as engineers. For example, oftentimes you'll pop into pair with an, you know, an early stage programmer and they'll have forgotten to save the file that they're working on. And it's like, wait, why isn't my, why isn't my chain showing up? And it's like, Hey, you forgot to save the file. You know, what, 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 what happened there? Right. Um, it's they've saturated themselves so much and there's so much noise that what is actually important, what matters is lost. So being deliberate about controlling your cognitive load is going to make it easier for you to program and easier for you to solve problems. Oftentimes when I am stuck on something, a bug or some feature that I can't figure out, I often ask myself, what can I remove from the environment such that I can get more signal and less noise. And that's also what I recommend when I, when I pair with a programmer who is stuck in some way. Close all the files except for the one that has the problem. Turn off everything, put your notifications on silent, go hide your phone, that kind of stuff. This tends to de-stress the programmer and it usually leads to a focused statement of the problem because we're not lost in the digital jungle. All right, so this idea of working memory that Barb has so expertly explained really reaches to the heart of software design itself. As you get more experienced as a software engineer, you start to hear principles of good programming. Now, while most people don't describe it this way, many, many, many of the principles that you'll hear are fundamentally about working memory management. So working memory management maps on to what many would consider good programming. So what one term you'll often hear is good programming is about abstraction. It's about hiding complexity in this, right? And uh, John Ousterhout, who's a Stanford CS professor, has this wonderful quote here that I think gets to the heart of it, which is, he says, the greatest limitation in writing software is our ability to understand the systems we're creating. Complexity accumulates, becomes harder and harder for programmers to keep all the relevant factors in their mind as they modify the system. So when you hear maxims like avoid complex state, avoid large functions that do too many things, avoid shadowing variables, all of these things that sound very technical, that sound very, very, say, specific to a language or this, what you can 
really here there is that principles of good programming are meant to economize this bottleneck we have in our minds around working memory. We want to free our minds to focus on the higher level aspects of software. So we don't have to hold so much information in our working memories to understand the system. Now let's talk about anxiety. Uh, the second cognitive skill that, uh, that I'd like to share here is anxiety management. And I'm going to argue that the ability to manage your own anxiety is actually a core engineering competency, which sounds really weird because you think that you're being paid to write code. But to some extent, you're also being paid for your psychology as an, as an engineer. Um, I believe anxiety is a natural part of the problem solving experience and the nature of being a software engineer in any company is that you're constantly being hit with problems and things that are broken. And every single time that you do, you feel some unease. And uh, this has led many people to point out that being tenacious and being, being, you know, weathering that storm and being willing to do that, um, that engineering is, that's, that, that tenacity is as important in engineering as it is about, say, being, being smart. Um, I agree that tenacity is important, but I, I like to think of it more of it, as about how do we use the tenacity we have in a smart way? How do we manage that anxiety? Um, rather than just say, try as hard as possible and really hope that you, that you break through, right? Um, so there are two ways that anxiety creates problem with software engineers. And the first of these is what I call code frenzy mode. Um, now, uh, let's talk about code frenzy mode here. Um, in my first year of programming, I would work myself into a frenzy of frustration rather than recognizing that my brain was overwhelmed and I needed to take a break. It felt like, hey, I'm, I'm giving up. And that if I spent another 10 minutes focusing as hard as I possibly could, then the answer would become obvious. It turns out that there are psychological and a, a, a neuroscience reasons why this is a bit of a delusional idea. And all it did was make me mad and stressed out and probably really made it harder for me to solve problems. So believe it or not, taking a break is really part of programmer productivity. Now, why? Because it's part of anxiety management. And Barb will now explain why it is, how it is that taking a break is a scientifically valid part of the engineer's problem solving process. So I, it's important to understand that the brain has two different ways of thinking. And this isn't just psychobabble. It's actually, we can visualize with fMRI the two different ways that the brain seems to function. First, it can have a tightly organ or like a, a small area of the brain that's associated with a particular task, like your programming task. And, and that is activated. When you're focusing some, on something, your central executive network is, is going, yes, I'm going to focus on this thing. And so you work on that task. But there's another mode altogether, and that is what I'll call the diffuse mode. Neuroscientists call it the default mode network. Um, psychologists call it the task negative network. In other words, it means you're not doing a task as opposed to the task positive network of the focus mode. So focus mode, some small area of the brain is really working on the task. Diffuse mode, many areas of the brain are connected. This is what you're doing when you're mind wandering, for example. So they sometimes say to, well, in essence, to activate that diffuse mode, bed, bath, or bus. So, you know, you, you go to bed, your brain relaxes. You take a shower or, or take a bath. Your brain relaxes. You kind of, you're still having thoughts, but they're kind of going randomly around. Or you're sitting in a bus watching the scenery go by. And your brain is like randomly um, thinking about different random thoughts not tightly focused. But to better understand these two different modes, what we'll use is a pinball machine. Now, if you're my age, you remember pinball machines, but you're probably not. So you've seen something like it in video games. All you need to do is pull back on a plunger, a ball goes bouncing around on a table that has rubber bumpers or equivalent on it. 
And that's how you get points. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this pinball machine and put it right on the human brain. Are you ready for it? Here we go. Okay, so there's our pinball machine on the brain. This is our metaphor or analogy for the focused mode of thinking. And in focus mode, you have these, remember how I said it was a tightly, like a, usually a small area of the brain and it's kind of like tightly focused on something. Usually that part of the brain is, has got patterns in it by virtue of the fact that you've already learned how to do something. In our case, let's say you already know how to do multiplication. But let's, so, so if I asked you to multiply 75 times 22, you would maybe pull out a sheet of paper or even perhaps do it in your head and you could multiply those two numbers. But let's say you were at a stage in your life where you knew multiplication, but you would never learn division. So the first time you sit down to really work a division problem, sure, you'd heard your teacher talk about it, you, you kind of got the central idea, you're sitting down, you got this, and you're working away by yourself, first tough problem, and you can't do it. Why? Well, you don't have those patterns laid yet. In fact, you don't even know where those patterns are going to be, but whatever's going on, your brain can't help but slither back to that multiplication because you're used to doing multiplication. You know how to do it, but you're not even conscious of the fact that you've slithered back there. So you can get cognitively fixed on your idea of how to solve that particular problem. And then that, you know, you end up getting more and more frustrated because your approaches are simply not working. Eventually you shut the book, you walk away and you just, you give it up. Here is the thing. When you get your focus completely off that problem, it opens up that other way of thinking, that diffuse mode, where your thoughts can range much more broadly. The interesting thing from our perspective is, as long as you were focusing on that problem that you were trying to solve, you were locking yourself in, cognitively fixed to this way that would not work. It's only when you step back into that, you know, and allow that diffuse mode to pop up that you could free yourself so that when you return to the focus mode, you could land in a place where you could start making sense of the problem. Often, learning involves going back and forth between focused and diffuse mode. You cannot be in both modes at the same time unless you're taking certain forms of mushrooms, and I am not advocating that here. And, but interestingly, if you have uh, ADHD, what can happen with ADHD is you turn your attention to something, you activate that focus mode, but because you have lower dopamine levels, at the same time you activate that focus mode, you can inadvertently be activating the default mode network. So both modes do activate at the same time. And that's why you can talk to someone with ADHD and they'll be looking at you and then, whoa, shiny, they just get distracted. So, but you might think, oh, you know, that's a terrible thing. It's always a problem. It's not. It can cause substantial creativity, but it's just you know, it's a little tougher because it can be harder to focus. But I should say as well that those with ADHD can hyper-focus on whatever they really get interested in. So this is why even Nobel Prize winning uh, individuals like Santiago Ramon y Cajal, my favorite scientist, um, he clearly had evidence of ADHD. And he was a terrible student. But once he found himself getting interested in medicine, 
watch out. He was incredible and, of course, won the Nobel Prize. So now let's talk about everyone's favorite, procrastination. So the second way that anxiety can really hurt software engineers is procrastination. To put it bluntly, procrastination can totally screw up your career as an engineer. You don't want to be the engineer that has the reputation for uh, putting everything off until the last minute and procrastinating. Now, I find that almost everyone tenses up when I start to talk about procrastination because everyone uh, has it happen to them and everyone feels that they that, that it's sort of a personal failing of themselves, right? And we all feel embarrassed about this personal failing of, of procrastinating stuff sometimes. Um, I think we can talk about procrastination objectively, right? So um, as, as Barb has uh, spoken about, you can sort of manufacture problem solving in yourself. And how do you do it? Well, you load in all the variables, focus really hard on the problem and go into that focus mode. And then you take time to relax. You go into the diffuse mode and let that different way of processing information take over. But of course, the only way that switching between focus and diffuse mode works is if you actually do the focus part, right? So the best programmers stick with a problem long enough to achieve insight. And that means being truly, totally focused on the problem when you're in that mode. Otherwise, you're just not equipping your brain to deliver insight and you're not loading in all the relevant variables required by the diffuse mode to help give you the creative insight to solve the problem. So what stands in the way of programmers and the effective use of that focus mode? Anxiety and procrastination. So when people turn their attention to a bug or a feature or a task that stresses them out, people will instead pick up their phone, idly check email, go on social media, or basically anything you know that feels more pleasant than the task at hand. Now, the digital age has made this kind of distraction really challenging for two reasons. The first is that there's tons of ultra smart engineers and other people uh, aggressively optimizing their experiences to get you sucked in. And, you know, a lot of people have heard some version of this, right? Um, but I think what's lesser understood is that there's a social element to modern technology that makes a text message or an email or a social media notification an especially potent distractor. If we think back to our very first slide, remember there was the tribe of hunter gatherers all, all, all hunting there, you know, humans are social creatures and we evolved to cooperate and understand each other, not to coldly ignore everyone around you. Uh, you can think of it this way. Think about if you were uh, working at a desk in an office and when so someone comes up and stands right at the edge of your desk and they're looking at you. Now, it, it, it doesn't, they don't have to say anything. They just have to be there, right? And uh, th this is intensely, intensely distracting. Right, You can't get down into it because there is this social link, this social expectation associated with the presence of another person. Now, weirdly, though, engineers, including engineers that work from home, right, they will import this toxic aspect of the open office plan into their workflows by allowing endless digital distractions with, with a social element to them into their workspace. Right, Notifications and things these create an open loop of social expectation in your brain. And it creates this background process of anxiety. I need to answer this person. Something important might have happened. What if there's an emergency? In computing terms, we might say that every notification that pops up consumes a little bit of mental RAM. Now, I think engineers you know, have it especially hard because if you're someone who's working in a physically you know, a physical engineering task, or, you know, you're working on an assembly line or this, you kind of can't do it in a halfway distracted fashion. You can't like be on Twitter and like use a lathe. Um, but uh, engineers live in the browser, right? It's the exact same UI that we used to do our work as we do to entertain and distract ourselves. Right. And companies often don't help. Right. They want their programmers always available for on Slack or for a quick Zoom check in. Right. Now, focused programming is easy to fake and engineers do it all the time. Everyone's guilty of this. I'm guilty of this, too. You know, you might have the files open on your computer, but Facebook open in another tab. Maybe your phone's on vibrate while you're trying to debug. In my opinion, the mere presence of a potential distractor is a bad idea. Um, because of what, uh, what, what Barb will soon explain. These digital distractors are the fuel of procrastination. 
exactly right. And, and what's really going on in procrastination is this. When you even just think about something you don't like or don't want to do, it activates a portion of the brain that experiences pain, the insular cortex. So what you tend to do is you think about something you don't want to do, you get this kind of icky feeling. So you turn your attention to something more pleasant and the result, you feel happier almost instantly. Do it once, do it twice, no big deal. Do it very often and you're, you can even ruin your career or not even get to that career because you think you just don't have the capacity to learn in that area when the reality is you've just delayed your studies and few people can study under those kind of stressful last minute conditions. Incidentally, sometimes people will say things like, procrastination is quite all right uh, because it allows you to formulate your thoughts so that you can really get down a good crystallized essence of well thought out ideas. No. That is true in certain circumstances, but not when you are learning things. As you've already seen, when you're learning, it takes time to build those sets of links together. And so, um, and so as you're learning, you, you've got to be giving yourself time. Learning is very different than doing something like writing a report and drawing up all the ideas for something you already know well. So, so how can you most effectively deal with procrastination, particularly when it comes to something like learning or, or even at work? Your best bet is to use the Pomodoro technique. You may have heard of this. I, I hope you have. Um, it is an incredibly powerful technique developed by Francesco Cidillo in the 1980s. It's so simple that anyone can do it. And now we know from neuroscience why it is so powerful. In fact, I get thousands of emails from people telling me, you know, from learning how to learn, that this technique is what made an enormous difference in their lives and their success in, in learning. And so let's see what it is that gets people's attention and, and helps them so much. To do a Pomodoro, you simply turn off all distractions. So no pop-ups on your computer, no cell phones doing a ringy dingy. Set a timer for 25 minutes. Focus as intently as you can for those 25 minutes. And if, if a thought pops up like, oh, I've got to do this, write it down. But as soon as you catch your mind wandering, get your mind right back on the task you're supposed to be doing. No one's perfect, but you just keep going. Anyone can do 25 minutes. When you're done, you reward yourself. So by reward, I mean something like, listen to a favorite song. Get up and go make a cup of tea. Walk around a little bit. Uh, just... Do something that does not involve focused attention. Because if you go check your emails or something, you know, or our text messages, you're actually returning to focus and everything you've learned in those previous 25 minutes can start to be, those dendritic spine connections can start to be overwritten. And so this is why that one five minute break after you've been learning can be so valuable. Some people do go for, you know, they, they'll do like a 40 minute Pomodoro. Different people will, will do different approaches. Generally the 25 minute is most popular, but for me, if I'm feeling really super on the go in the morning, I might do a one hour Pomodoro. But when I'm done, I try to rest and let my brain with whatever I've learned to kind of master that new information, have that time of relaxation. 
So what can we do to actually concretely fight distraction while doing a Pomodoro, for example? One of the most important things is to hide your phone. The key thing is to not put it nearby and not put it in eyesight because even just the, the mere presence of that phone starts to draw you in with all the possibilities of what might be in there. And certainly if it's making sounds and being right there, you're going to be uh, drawn into it. Now, some people... Uh, have gone sort of uh, taken radical choices here, uh, which is they've resorted to putting their phone into timed containers that only open after a set period. This is actually a screenshot of an Amazon listing for this uh, timed container product. And I thought it was so funny that this retailer shows the cell phone next to M&Ms, which sort of should tell you everything you need to know about, healthy, about how healthy it is to have a smartphone so close by uh, when, you're, when you're working. Um, now, what about people who, let's say, you can't just like lock away your phone, which I totally understand is just not the case for, for some people. There's a more gentle approach, which is try do not disturb. Uh, you, you, if you set your, oftentimes you can set things up such that you can go truly on do not disturb while still allowing loved ones or pager duty if you're an engineer get through. Um, I, at one point, I had my phone on do not disturb for uh, literally years. <laughs> and the only person that could uh, talk to me was uh, were significant others or pager duty for, for my job. Um, there are also great software solutions that can help you with focus. Freedom is a software suite that blocks certain applications by time of day. Rescue time is an extension that gives you raw data on your productivity. When you look at that data, the output can be truly, truly sobering. Uh, I know the first time I ever did that, I, I, I felt absolutely humiliated and I thought no one can ever see this readout because I was wasting so much time, right? Um, and then there are Pomodoro apps like Forest, which kind of gamify the process of doing a, a, a Pomodoro. So all of those are, are, I think, valuable tools. And what what's great about them is it can make it more fun. You feel the sense of accomplishment each time you've done a Pomodoro. And what we want to stress is a lot of times you don't want to think about completing a task. You, you want to focus on the process, developing a process, like I'm gonna do four Pomodoros in a day or during this study session, not the product which is I'm going to finish this programming task or whatever you set out to do. Setting up a good process involving certain amounts of time, Pomodoro is wonderful at helping you to do that. Now, we, we should switch gears a little bit. I, I just want to bring up my favorite athlete of all time. And no, this is not just an excuse to bring up my favorite athlete of all time. He's actually a really super smart athlete who can teach us as well about how to use our brains effectively. So Julius Eagle is from Kenya. And Julius is, he, if you know anything about Kenya, you know they're famous for their long distance runners. But if you look at Julius's arms, he is not a long distance runner. In fact, I mean, he always wanted to run to throw the javelin, that spear, but he couldn't afford um, to go for season study and there were no javelin throwing coaches in all of Kenya. So this very intelligent man, what he did was he began watching YouTube videos and he would watch them and then he would go out and he would practice, watch, practice. And do you know that 98% of the time by watching and practicing, he became the world champion in throwing the javelin. So what this tells you is you can learn things online as you can here with Class Central in ways that you just never thought you could learn and you can be really successful at it. Now, we should just take a little step uh, at what Julius teaches us as well that can give us a little information about um, learning overall. For thousands of years, people thought the only way you could really learn was just to sit there and listen to somebody lecturing like, you know, like I am lecturing right now in a sense. 
but then um, psychologists, some of the same psychologists who we met earlier, who said, you can always just look it up, said, no, 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 lecture is bad. It has to be active learning. In other words, the person is actually doing it on their own. But think back to Julius Ego. Could he just go out and do it on his own? No, he had to have good coaching. So now people are finally beginning to acknowledge that it's not just people going out and doing things. They need some instruction and they need some practice. So it, how much instruction, how much lecture, how much active learning practice, you know, it, it depends on so many different things. What are you studying? What is your background expertise in that area? Um, you know, lots of different factors. But what we do know is that this mixture of lecture and active learning, which is called direct instruction, is the best methodology for learning around. So what it really means is, learn from online or wherever you're getting that, that nice instruction from, then go forth and practice with it, just like Julius did. Learn and then go forth and practice. And this mixture is actually something that we can delve into and dive into the brain and see how it relates, roughly speaking, to some important neural pathways that are in the brain. So before I had talked about those nice sets of neural links, well, what I didn't mention was there's two ways that those links can be laid. Now, don't worry, I'm gonna lay some terminology on you. You don't need to remember this terminology. So you can take information from working memory through the hippocampus into long-term memory. That's called declarative learning or procedural learning, which goes through the basal ganglia. Either way, you lay sets of links, but those sets of links have different characteristics that will help you in different ways. And you need both sets, both types of sets of links in order to be able to learn effectively. So what are those, those um, kind of different characteristics? I'll just swiftly kind of cover uh, a, a few of those key ideas. You're not conscious of what you learn procedurally. When I learn how to type on a keyboard, I do not sit there and think, okay, F key, I need to press, let's see, the fourth one over from the left. I, no, I know it procedurally, I can just do it. It develops through practice. You can't explain it or not easily. So like a Rubik's cube, you may know how to solve it, but it's really tough to explain because you learned it through that procedural system. It's, it can be very long, tedious, and slow to learn something procedurally. But once you learn it, like with that keyboard, what, like with coding, you're super fast. It can be inflexible. If my uh, mischievous husband came and rewired my keyboard so that uh, the keys didn't follow as they were supposed to, it would take me a long time to learn to reprogram my, my fingers because that procedural system is inflexible. Declarative learning, on the other hand, you're very conscious of, you can explain it. It involves sequential kind of tasks like following a set of procedures. So they did they goof up that terminology or what? So forget I said that. But anyway, sequential tasks is declarative learning. Uh, and you can be flexible with what you found that way. So let's talk about procedural learning and in particular procedural fluency. In other words, being, being very fluent and having that kind of that tacit deep understanding that, uh, that Barb is talking about. How is it? What is procedural fluency in the world of the software engineer? Um, so one aspect is certainly tooling, specifically things like hotkeys, shortcuts, and accessory tools like Bash or, or the terminal. Right now, uh, someone once told me that 
uh, learning shortcuts and learning hotkeys. It was quote for people who wanted to be an alpha geek, and they they did not mean it as a compliment. Um, it was associated, you know, flying around with hotkeys and shortcuts and navigating around quickly and all that. It was associated with this stereotype. In my opinion, this is really a short sighted perspective. Um, the, the, the stereotype is that basically the super nerd obsesses with these really low level and arcane tools to do their work. And the harder and more obscure the tool, the cooler it is, right? Now, I want to be clear. I'm not suggesting that you should spend all your time messing around with tools. Uh, you know, there's a joke that programmers would rather, you know, reconfigure their editor than ship the feature they're paid to write. And there's some truth to that. And I'm very much not saying that. But I think as you're starting out in your career as an engineer, uh, it's important not to discount the value of hotkey shortcuts and tools like the terminal. Now, uh, when I first pair programmed with a really experienced engineer, the thing that stuck out to me was how fast they were. Their workflow was just fast. They typed fast. They navigated fast. And, and most importantly, they solved problems fast. And they knew all this magical stuff that just like wrangled code in every direction with extreme efficiency. And I'm sure you've seen this, for instance, in some of your, uh, your bootcamp instructors. Now, these developers had procedural fluency in their tooling. They knew how to move around, how to find things, how to get things done. And that meant their mind was free to focus on solving the real problem. So let's be concrete here and let's talk about two areas for investment that an early career developer could do to get some procedural fluency uh, in tooling. And that's the code editor and that's the terminal. So investing in the code editor, if you're using a code editor and you don't know how to jump the definition, rename symbol, uh, jump between lines and words with one key press, you know, move a line down, you're really missing out. There's just a small number of these things that you should memorize. And after you memorize them, it's not going to take you long to memorize them, but it helps you avoid fussing with files and navigation. And it keeps you in the flow of problem solving, which is, which is what you're paid to really to do. Now, similarly, the terminal, which can feel really intimidating at first, but it's a it's a powerful tool. Now you don't need to be some you know Linux terminal wizard to massively improve your your life and your workflow. A really small investment in the terminal early in your career can compound over time and help you out. So on the right hand side here, I have a few example tools that are just basic tools in the terminal: grep, ack, curl, jq, etc. Um, they're easy to learn, they have, but they're very powerful. Now, why bother making this investment? It's because the terminal takes complex actions and behaviors, like moving around files, requesting a website, whatever, and it compresses it down into a few simple keyboard strokes. Now, why might we want complex behaviors condensed into a few keyboard strokes? Well, because fundamentally, programmers are also typists. Another powerful investment you can make early in your career that will compound over time, and that is procedural fluency, is your typing speed. Uh, basically, every amazing programmer types really fast. It's, you know, it's not universally true, but it's like kind of true. There, there's really an association there. Now, it's not a necessity, right? You could imagine, for instance, a person with, with certain disabilities who may not be able to do this. But often, when you see someone who's really able to put out code quickly, it's almost like a shorthand for a person with a high degree of procedural fluency in their domain. When you're problem solving, you don't want your typing speed to be the bottleneck on your thinking. The good news is there's tons of typing tutors available, um, even some that focus on the weird keys that programmers often type more often, you know, that, that type more often than uh, the typical typist. Um, this screenshot is from the keyboard configuration on a Mac laptop. One of the easiest things you can do to get yourself started in this sort of typing procedural fluency path is to crank up all the settings to their maximum under this um, this keyboard menu. It's going to make your keyboard much faster and more responsive. And it'll feel weird first, but uh, it, it, it pays dividends in time. Okay. The next bit of procedural fluency in the world of engineering, procedural fluency in language. Now this traces right back to what Barb mentioned earlier around this idea. Oh, I can just look it up, right? How many of you have heard this before in reference to a programming language or a programming concept? Many people say this, but it's not really true. Now, 
it is true that there are always going to be these obscure things that you're going to have to look up or a new API that you're going to be using. You're going to have to look that up. Not many days will go by where you're, you're, you're going to look up nothing, right? But there's a baseline of nouns and verbs and grammar that are required for any competent performance. I think there's a really strong analogy here to learning a, a spoken language, right? So if, if I told you, yeah, I speak French, I just have to look up uh, all the grammatical rules and every verb and noun to put together a sentence. Do I really speak French? Like, I, I don't really, right? Um it's very similar. That's just as true for French or Mandarin as it is for Java or Go or JavaScript, right? Um, one way to think about this is to imagine yourself punctuating a sentence in, in English, for example. When you're writing, do you want to be thinking, well, I, you know, I just put a period. And so the next letter, well, there needs to be a space. And the next letter then after that needs to be capitalized. And no, you wouldn't want to think about this, right? It would slow down your ability to write to a crawl. And the same applies to your ability to write code. Now, what is worth memorizing? St there's standard libraries and standard modules and functions, which are the nouns and verbs and grammar of a programming language or a framework that you're working in. Um, you've got to, you, you have to memorize these things to take advantage of what the procedural system can offer you. If a verb or a noun is not in long-term storage, it's not available to the procedural system. And it's also not going to be available when you're problem solving. Okay. So there's another dimension here, which is equipping yourself to have a lot of problem solving tools. When you see great programmers solving a problem, they can often produce multiple possible solutions. How? because they have a deep understanding of their language and tools. They grasp the problem more quickly because they have this deeper procedural understanding of the language and tools and systems. And they're not hung up on syntax, they're hung up on problem solving. Okay, so what can we do to actually train the procedural system? It's memorization. Memorization is really, it's uncool. It's kind of, it's like unsexy now. And there's even people who use phrases like drill and kill to describe the idea of memorization. But what we've seen uh, and what Barbara shared is that there's just no way around this. My suggested memorization list is here on this slide. Um, some will disagree. I've just tried to keep it as simple as possible. These are categories of things that are used in essentially all programs. They're core verbs and nouns. You don't have to think about them and you don't want to have to think about them while you're doing your daily work. How do you write a loop? What, you know, is true, true and true? Does that equal true or does true, you know, true and false or true or false, these kind of Boolean arrangements, you need to understand that quickly. How do you write a class? How do you write a function? These are the table stakes of memorization um, that, that uh, set, yourself, set yourself up for, for success. So this brings us to a, I think a key question. And that is, what do you think is the most powerful technique to help students learn most efficiently? So let's give you four options here. Rereading, highlighting or underlining. Which one of these two have you done? Have you done retrieval practice like creating flashcards or creating a concept perhaps, a concept map? where you write down those key ideas and then connect them together. These four techniques are amongst the most prominently or, or commonly used techniques um, to study with. You can always tell people from education because they'll say, I use concept mapping as my key idea, key way of learning. You can always tell um, honest people because they'll often say things like, well, I reread and I highlight. <laughs> but uh, actually research has shown that the most valuable technique by far is retrieval practice. And in fact, I know a, um, a medical doctor who started his own company and he graduated number one in his medical school class by, do not do this at home. He skipped class, watched videos and read the books and he created flashcards. And that's how he graduated number one in his class. So if you're, uh, you know, whatever you do, use retrieval practice, flashcard-like approaches. 
And, uh, and let me just give you a sense of why. When you first learn something, like uh, Zach and I are explaining these ideas to you. So you're getting an initial sense of ideas and you're way, laying weak links in your long-term memory. But every time you retrieve those key ideas, you are strengthening them. So here's the difference. After this talk, if you go out and you go for a walk or you uh, lie in bed as you're falling asleep or whatever you're doing, you, you say, what were the key ideas from that talk? Drawing it from your own mind, you will learn, remember, and be able to use these ideas far more effectively than if you just watched our lecture, our whole video again. So it's getting those ideas in your own mind and then checking and retrieving them to strengthen them. That's what really builds these ideas and strengthens them. If you don't do that, what happens is your little synaptic janitor will come and just sweep away the dendritic spines that aren't being used and voila, you will forget them. So it, I, we can actually see this with a living neuron. This is a dendrite before learning and before sleep. And can you imagine what this dendrite looks like after learning and after sleep? Do you think it's maybe got a fatter leg on it or maybe more dendritic spines? Ah, here we go. This is that same living dendrite after learning and after sleep. Wherever you see these little blue triangles, you can see a new dendritic spine has either emerged or has gotten bigger. So actually, uh, not only learning, but the sleep process really helps build those connections. And indeed, during sleep, your little dendritic, those, those electrical signals and neurotransmitter signals will run hundreds and hundreds of times across those synaptic connections during the time you're sleeping. So a good trick is right, so do your studying during the day, but right before you go to sleep, you know, so presumably you have played with your family, you've done all these things, at, but those two or three minutes before you go to sleep, retrieve to mind the key idea that you're trying to remember or understand and then go to sleep. And your brain, it's like signaling your brain, oh yeah, you know, what she wanted me to do was to practice with those particular things, uh, you know, especially. And it will do that. And it will help you to more rapidly acquire those proficiencies that you're trying to get. If you really have time, those two minutes when you first awake, try to draw it back in mind again. And that will really help build this, these, these connections. Spaced repetition is an integral part of, of, of retrieval practice. Sp just retrieving over a number of days. This will help strengthen your new connections much more than just cramming, um, like if you had five hours in one day, cramming all your studies in one day, your connections will not be very strong because they haven't had sleep. So your synaptic janitor can sweep them away. As opposed to these, if you have five hours and you space it out one hour per day over five days, ah, what's happening is you're learning, going to sleep, double strengthen, learning, sleep, double strengthen. So you're getting almost like twice the bang for your buck, so to speak when you do retrievals practice spaced out over a, a number of days. If you have a note, uh, like 100 vocabulary words, you're in a foreign language, your tendency would be to do 20 words one day, 20 words one day, and so forth, and just add more. Try to do the 100 that first day, and then the second day, and the third day, you'll have more repetitions that way, and you'll learn them uh, more deeply. I like to think of it as take your time in learning, like building a brick wall takes time. You lay a layer of bricks, mortar, bricks, mortar. Before that mortar, you know, before you go too high, you let the mortar dry. 
if you don't, you have a pretty lousy foundation for learning. So when you are learning, remember we've got those two declarative procedural pathways. Retrieval practice will help you with both pathways. Spaced repetition will help you with both pathways. And explanation will help you with declarative learning while varied practice and interleaving will help you with that procedural learning. What is interleaving? It's essentially taking different topics. So let's say that you're, you're learning about uh, statistics. So you're learning um, the binomial distribution, the negative binomial distribution, the geometric distribution. You do um, four problems of each one and you think you got it nailed, but then you get the final. What is the final? The final is you don't know what those distributions are. They're mixed up. So even when you're practicing, you want to practice sort of different ideas, different approaches. Uh, it, otherwise, you, you'll be surprised because you've learned to use a tool, but you haven't learned how to, uh, to easily and fluidly know which tool to pick up. So as far as engineers go, flashcards are really one of the simplest and most effective tools. Um, you do a lot of memorization, as we've already discussed, of uh, language elements and other tools. Uh, why leave it up to chance? You don't have to leave it up to chance. You can go on GitHub right now and you can find Anki decks. This is a screenshot of the software Anki. Uh, for most languages and frameworks, they're free, they're open source. You just load them into Anki and then Anki takes care of the rest as long as you open the app and, and, and open the deck. Um, in particular, Anki has a built-in spaced repetition algorithm. So it's going to tell you when you need to review cards, which is great. Now, let's talk about programming as a procedural craft, okay? Talking about this, this not the declarative, but the procedural side of uh, what Barb has mentioned. As you uh, move from beginning, being a beginning programmer and you move to more, you know, higher levels of expertise, you're going to find yourself encountering more and more abstract things. In fact, you often end up thinking more, but writing less code. And you might end up designing systems rather than implementing the details. Or you might be the person who refactors code rather than being the initial author of it, which is often highly conceptual work. You simply cannot reach these high levels of abstraction if you don't have mastery over the concrete elements of the craft of, of software. Um, as we saw in Barb's remarks, procedural fluency, it offloads cognitive load uh, out of your working memory into your muscle memory, into your, your procedural system. Procedural mastery, it leaves more resources for thinking because of what you're not thinking about. You're not thinking, what's that hotkey again? You're not thinking, how do I declare an array? What's a loop? Is true and false true or is it false? In this way, programming is, is really deeply a procedural craft and your long-term success in the field depends on your procedural system holding that deep understanding of the lower level complexities of a system and the technology that makes it work. Everything we've discussed so far, from hotkeys to memorization to the use of focus and diffuse modes, all of it is there to drive that deep understanding into your brain. Now, as you enter the industry and you maybe get your first job or maybe you have your first job and you're looking to become a senior engineer, you will discover that procedural fluency, it's rewarded in our industry. People want programmers who can solve problems and who can ship code. They don't just want talkers who have a conceptual understanding about technology, okay? Ultimately, great programmers use both the declarative and the procedural systems. They'll have an ability to understand the system conceptually and explain it, but their thinking is informed and it's disciplined by their deep, that deep procedural understanding of these concrete aspects of, of software. Um, now, this is the basis for what we might call programmer intuition. Now, I view programmer intuition as it's like the holy grail of programming skill. 
And there are some amazing programmers who can look at an error or even just hear someone vaguely describe a problem and they'll instantly know where to look or even the solution to the problem. Now, for a given system, right, say the system that you're building at, a, at your first job, you can grow this intuition over time about where a problem comes from uh, by interacting with that system and by submerging those details into that, that procedural understanding. Now, when people say, for instance, how, how does a senior plus engineer solve a problem in 15 minutes that a more junior engineer takes eight hours to solve? right? It's not just because the senior engineer has a, a better conceptual understanding of the system. Um, oftentimes, the, the, the senior engineer can't even tell you every step in the reasoning chain about why they arrived at the solution they did. Their intuition was their guide. Uh, we can think of that intuition as almost like it's this pattern recognition in your brain that allows you to intuit problems associated with language and tools. To me, this intuition, it's the mark of true expertise. And it takes the, that, the heady conceptual world of the declarative system and the murky subconscious world of the procedural system, and it brings them together. Um, it's not something that comes easy. It takes time. But having a commitment to the kinds of cognitive skills that we've shared with you today will take you a really long way towards this, this goal. And so as we close, I would just... Uh, like to bring back my hero, Julius Yego, who gives us a lot of insight into the idea that you can learn very effectively online, mostly on your own, but also remembering that you learn from great instructors as you have with C Class Central, but then go forth and practice. So even with the ideas we've shared with you today, You've learned them, but now go forth and retrieve those key ideas. I can't help but also allude to our original Learning How to Learn, which is uh, one of the world's most popular uh, massive open online courses. And uh, uh, there's also, if you have children, there's a uh, version for youth. There's also uh, a brand new, I just finished it a few days ago. Our team uh, has launched teaching online, and it's got great information on how to change your own motivation and your feelings of identity to become a programmer, as well as the specialization as a whole. So if you go in there, just keep in mind that it might say, oh, pay this money, but all you need to do is just register as an auditor and you will have access to almost everything in the course. So uh, I hope that this is all very helpful for you. Uh, Zach and I are uh, we're truly grateful to Class Central for bringing us here today. And we are ready if, in case you have any questions. Hello, everybody. Just want, let me just want to take a second to give you a huge round of applause. I hope the whole chat will join me with some clap emojis because that was truly wonderful. Um, thank you both so much. This this is my second time watching this lecture, and it is absolutely incredible uh, how much it just speaks to me every time that I do that you do. So thank you both so much. I have been uh, gathering up a. I'm just gonna. Remove the overlay for a second so we can see Barb's name there. <laughs> um, That's okay. I already know who I am. So <laughs> <laughs> it just feels, oh, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this. Ha. Huh. Now I can bring back the banner because oh, people know who I am. You can see your name. That's fine. People know who I am. So, <laughs> so here's what we're going to do, folks. I have been gathering up some questions as the lecture has been going, but. Folks in the chat, I am keeping. Ooh, I'm keeping an eye and bookmarking some more questions as we go. So please bring them in. I'm gonna start showing them on the screen and reading them out loud, and then letting you two answer them accordingly. So, and we've got a couple of questions related to uh, the age at which we start programming. I'm gonna take an example here. Is it too late to start programming at 29 years old? Zach, no. you want to handle this one? <laughs> Go for it. 
<laughs> That's a pipsqueak. You're still a youngster. Uh, absolutely, you can learn. Um, you can learn really at any age. 29 is still relatively flexible, malleable. Uh, you know, all it takes is time. So I started at 26 in learning math and science. So um, there are uh, really great stories of people who have learned complete other languages up into their 50s, 60s, and 70s. So um, it, 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 your procedural system can slow down a little bit as you age, but it still can function. You just need to be sure you get plenty of practice with it. And of course that declarative system, as you're learning new things, you're, here's the really cool thing. When you're learning something new, uh, we used to think that you were born with all the neurons you'd ever have, and then you got old and they gradually died off and you got senile and it was really a depressing way to look at the world. But now um, they found that they were dead wrong. In fact, new neurons are being born every day, in, particularly in the hippocampus, which you've seen is very important for learning and memory. And what these new neurons do is they help you feel better. It's a, a big part of uh, depression research now involves the field of neurogenesis, of new neurons, because new neurons help you feel better. Well, guess what? If you're learning something new, those new neurons have some place that they've got to stick into because you're making them stick in in order to be able to learn something new. But if you're not learning something new, those new neurons just die. So, uh, so your new learning as your programming is not only, not only can you do it at age 29, it will make you feel better at age 29 or at age 45 or whenever you're learning. It's, a, uh, it's no surprise that when COVID came and school shut down and they said no new learning, in some states there was no new learning altogether, depression rates skyrocketed. So it's uh, new learning is a great thing to do, no matter how you may grumble about it uh, on occasion, because it, it not only can open new career doors, but it can really truly make you feel better. I love that. I'm a huge advocate of learning. So it's always so refreshing to hear that. Thank you. Let's go to the next question. And thank you for the question, by the way. So we got a whole bunch of them. I don't want to keep you all too long. Again, your time is so massively appreciated. So I will quickly move on to the next one. How do you know your working memory capacity? Oh, let's see. If you go to um, learn like a pro on edX, that's a course that I did with uh, my colleague, Olaf Shewe. And there's actually a test in there that you can take um, that Olaf developed, and uh, you can see what your working memory capacity is. So that's an easy way to, uh, uh, a good rule of thumb is if you are listening to lectures and you can listen and you can take notes or you can listen to the lecture, but you can't do both, you probably have a working memory capacity like mine, and it, it's more like three. So, uh, but if you can listen to the lecture and take notes and you kind of understand what's going on, you probably have a working memory capacity of four or five or more. I think Zach has a very large working memory capacity. <laughs> I, I don't actually. That's uh, I think how I ended up with all this uh, this obsessiveness around you know don't put your phone here, turn off notifications, that kind of stuff. I was trying to trying to bring uh, the octopus arms you have to bear on the problem. <laughs> Interestingly, like Friedrich Hayek won the Nobel Prize, and he was definitely a slow learner with let let us just say a less than optimal working memory capacity. But that was his secret gift because the people with the bigger working memory capacities, they just, they understood it. They got it. They would jump to conclusions. And when they were wrong, they were less flexible. There's plenty of evidence that people with big working memory capacities who are really smart, so to speak, 
are also less flexible. So when they think they've got something figured out, they can't change their minds very easily. Whereas people with lesser capacity working memory like, <laughs> like us, uh, um, we can learn something. But if we find out that we're wrong, we can much more flexibly change our mind instead of finding some way to justify why we were right after all. So, um, so working memory is a fascinating area and uh, you could fall deep into the depths of uh, studying working memory capacity because it's just so entrancingly interesting. I love that, thank you. Let's move on to the next one. Ah! Can the neocortex run out of space? The neocortex has more synaptic connections than there are stars in the universe, more synaptic connections than there are grains of sand everywhere on Earth. Um, it, it's not a matter of running out of connections. It's simply a matter of making sure you can find the connections you have already made, which as you remember more and more, can be more difficult to kind of, you know, because sometimes like for me, like the difference between now for me and 20 years ago is like, oh my word, okay, now was it this research or this, you know, it's like I know thousands of different researchers where as 20 years ago, it was maybe I knew, you know, like 10 or 15. So, you know, it's more, it's just a question of being, of using retrieval practice to keep the important information fresh in your memory so that you can retrieve it. But I, I think related in an odd way is very recent research that shows that when you are learning something, you know how you, your brain just gets tired um, and, you, and you, know, you just have to kind of quit after a while because you're just, you're tired mentally. We used to think it was some kind of metabolic energy that we used up, but now they're finally, just this last month, they're beginning to realize it's GABA buildup. It's a buildup of a metabolite that's like a, a bit of a, a little bit of a neurotoxin, and that's why you start feeling weary, and sleep helps wash that away. But this is also, they think, perhaps why you can study a subject, you get really tired, but you know, if you, if you switch to another subject that's rather different, it's using a different part of the brain and that, that part of the brain maybe isn't as tired. Overall, I should say, I, I'm sorry, I can prattle forever, but um, so, I, and then I'll hand it back to Zach, but uh, expert on expert Anders Ericsson has found that normally we have about four hours in the day where we're really, we're really at the peak of, of the kind of really intense mental work that we can do. This doesn't mean, oh, you just do your four hours and then don't do anything at all. It just means that schedule around those four hours, try to do the toughest stuff then and the lesser stuff after you've already kind of tuckered your brain out. Uh, so like if you're, if emails is a lesser part of what you're doing in a day, then, um, you know, kind of save that to do after those concentrated four hours where you're trying to do your most difficult learning or the most difficult mental tasks. So Zach, back to you, sorry, prattling away. No, not at all. I, I'm not bringing any firepower to the question of can the neocortex run out of space? <laughs> uh, well, there's, I know there's going to be, uh, I, I can't bring firepower to a lot of the coding questions or coding related questions like Zach can. So maybe we can shift to some of those. Sounds good. Let's see. We've got a question. Um, Let's get some questions for Zach because we've got a, we've got some soon, and I want to be very conscious of your time. Um, hmm. Here's one. Can we get to know some apps to help typing faster? And I think we saw one during the lecture. Mm. Yeah, interesting. I, I, honestly, 
Um, I, I've, I can't recall the name, but if you, if you go online and you search for uh, typing tutor for programmers, there's actually some specifically designed for it. The, the reason is that, you know, engineers type uh, different things than a standard typist. And so it just kind of guides you in that direction. I'm sorry, I can't recall the name, but if you search programming tutor for programmers, you'll find it. I think my daughter, I think Rachel used Mavis Beacon Learns Typing. Uh, and that was really good, but that was back in the day. So I don't know if Mavis Beacon has updated her. That's her. a total nostalgia bar, <laughs> Mavis Beacon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Same. Uh, thank you. Got another question, a specific question for Zach is, do you have any education or blog that we can look at? Oh, sure. Um, so I, uh, I do publish some stuff mostly related to you know programming, education, entrepreneurship at my website, which is Zach.dev, which is also sort of my, my internet moniker. And um, I write a newsletter, not so much associated with education, but on a, uh, an interesting topic at startupcities.com. So if you're interested in startups and, and that kind of stuff, that's another place where I, I would love to connect with you all. And may I say what a breathtaking website that is. Uh, it, it's made to look <laughs> like you, Windows Ramon. 95, 98. It's very, very cool. In uh, fact, that's how I got to meet Zach originally was kind of uh, indirectly related to your work with Startup Cities. And uh, it's, it is really awesome. Uh, without it, we wouldn't have met. And so uh, it's, uh, please do check it out. Fabulous. Let's get another question. Again, I want to be very conscious of both y'all's time. So please give me a heads up when I should do the last one. Huh? So. I think there's uh, going to be two more. Do you think, Zach? Yes, that's just fine. Thank you. Fabulous. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Because I, I want to, now I want to be very careful. Ah, my question for Zach. Most tech companies kind of always want developers to take coffee, which keeps the mind kind of hyper. From the perspective of health and productivity, is it okay? Right, so I think Bob can speak actually to the uh, the, the neuroscience and the, the health effects of coffee. I know she has some views there. Uh, I am a, you know, I, I am a caffeinated person. It does help me get through the day. Um, I, I think you can go too far. And, and I would say that being conscious of, of stimulants, of caffeine intake, is part of this anxiety management conversation that, uh, um, that we had earlier in the, in, in the, in the presentation. Um, because I have found that if I am already quite stressed about something, you know, some bug or something I need to make, and then I, I caffeinate, it makes me much less effective because I'm just too, I'm too wound up about the, the, the problem. Um, so I think of it as, you know, it can help you get there, but you want to be intentional with your use. And yeah, the tech company with the infinite free coffee, I think you can sometimes take it too far. Yeah. If it affects your sleep and a coffee has it like an eight hour half life. So, you know, you think about that and you have some in the morning. Uh, then if you have some in the afternoon, if you're sensitive to it, it can really affect your sleep and sleep is an important part of learning. So yeah, just taking care that way. But it, it does help you focus, um, you know, so I love my morning coffee. Wonderful. Thank you. So we'll do our last question. And again, folks, if you're not able to get your answer question, your question answered today, don't worry. We're going to throw out some ways that you can sign up for courses or get in touch with Zach and Barb. So there is time. But here we go. I'm going to ask uh, one final question, which is this one here. Is it bad to be a hiking learner and not a high speed racer one? It's great to be a hiker learner. <laughs> uh, you know, let's see, do I have, oh, I, you know, I have just a wonderful, um, let me see if I can uh, pull it up. Zach, if you want to handle this for just a minute. Sure. So uh, one thing about this, this, distinction between the racer and the hiker is like Barb mentioned earlier, there's a way in which sometimes the high speed racer, they can be inflexible and certain that they're right. They maybe overlook important details. And also if you think of it as say you're driving a Lamborghini versus you're hiking, when you hike, you sort of take in more of the environment around you. 
And a hiker learner might not just notice things better or, you know, things that others have overlooked, but also they may have in some ways a sort of deeper, a deeper understanding of that problem space because they, they slowly got there rather than, than rocketing there. I would also say from the engineering side, um, as you get again to more abstract levels of engineering, uh, hiking, you kind of like you run up against the limit of being a race car learner and you, there's just no way you're ever going to understand all of the relevant contexts. And so there's a way in which that hiker learner uh, aspect of trying to understand the problem space, the intuitive side of things, having technical judgment about decisions. These are much, uh, I think like being a hiker learner and getting there can really equip you well for that. So Definitely don't see it as um, one absolutely better than the other. <laughs> exactly right. And so um, let's see if I can share screen again. Um, you got it. I'll happily share it. Okay. Uh, I will bring this up. So, um, okay, here we go. So this is going to show you. Okay. So a slow, oops, here we go. Um, a slow learner. What happens during the day is that they can, you know, they learn something, but then as they, you know, they think they learn it, but, but what really happens is, you know, they forget it really easily. They have a differing bath of neurochemicals. But a fast learner, on the other hand, they, they remember things. So you think, oh, I want to be a faster learner. But remember, they made those connections. They think they've got it and they can't reconfigure those connections very easily. Whereas the slower learner kind of rethinks it and relearns it the next day. So who are the best diagnosticians as medical doctors? It's not what they call the gunner who has a really good memory because that gunner with a great memory just says, oh yeah, mentions this, 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 that's it. Okay, this is the diagnosis done. But the better diagnostician, they think about it, they think about it, and they reconfigure, and they are, can make much better medical uh, diagnoses because of that flexibility. So I, I think one thing that is important to keep in mind is that fast learners are fast, but they're inaccurate. Slow learners are much more accurate and they're more flexible at the same time. So keep in mind, fast learners can be inaccurate. They jump to conclusions and they're inflexible. Slower learners, more accurate, but also more flexible. So it's, uh, I think it's a really, uh, you know, I would not trade being a slower learner for anything. Um, and there are Nobel Prize winners who are who were slow learners. And it's because you're looking at things differently. You know, a race car, everything goes by in a blur. Hiker, they can reach out, touch the leaves on the trees, smell the pine in the air, completely different experience, in some ways far richer and deeper. So it's okay to be a hiker. I love that. And with that, we will call it a day. Zach and Barb, thank you both so much. Uh, I will say, if you want to get in touch with Zach, go to zach.dev or startupcities.com. With Barb, how can folks get in touch with you if they want to learn more? Oh, if they just go to my website, barbaraoakley.com, and there's a little thing there that says, you know, uh, email Barb here, and I actually do see those emails. Although I can be a little slow sometimes because, like right now, we just launched the MOOC and it's been a little hectic. But uh, uh, it's it's uh, very fun, and I'm hoping to one of these days coerce uh, Mr. Caceres to uh, <laughs> <laughs> do a, a MOOC together because it's. It would just be fantastic. The way he looks at this, you have no idea how, or maybe you do now, he gives you concrete ways to really understand how these theoretical insights from cognitive neuroscience 
can be practically useful in making your new learning much easier and much more in depth. So thank you. Wonderful. Zach, sorry, I interrupted thank, you. No, no, I just was going to say thank you all. And thanks, Barb. You're, you're much too kind. And thanks also, Ramon and everybody at Class Central. It's really fun to do this. Wonderful. Well, folks, that's it for today. Classes will resume on Monday. Once again, thank you to both our guests. Let's give them a big hand and say bye for now.